Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's HBO's original series, Watchmen, season one, episode five, entitled Little Fear of Lightning. I'll do a recap of the entire episode with the review comments at the end. That's all coming up next. It's Bunny. Opening scene, we are informed about the location and the year, Hoboken, 1985. We see a bus pull up with several young gentlemen inside. They get off of the bus and one older gentleman, he begins to speak to the young men who just get off the bus. And he says, young men, gentlemen, let's pray. Lord, help and guide us as we enter into the, the whore's den. Let's steadfast and let's keep in mind of what our goals are as we're here. One minute until midnight, we are reaching the brink of extinction, extinction, pardon me, and let us keep our minds open to what is ahead of us, amen. He stops one young one man and says, one minute until midnight, Wade. Remember that, tick tock, tick tock. As the young man, Wade, starts to look around and he wants to look at his environment, there are young people kissing, smoking. They are just whirling dervishes, just going wherever the wind blows. They're not focused. He's seeing this world that's outside of himself in a very meek voice. He has Jehovah Witness Watchtower pamphlets and he's saying very softly, but at the same time trying to give eye contact of people that are around him and saying that the time is now, the watchtower clock has moved to one minute before midnight, before this country unleashes the nuclear warfare against the Russians. And as he's saying this, trying to convince people to turn their lives over and hear the truth, they're not hearing it, but one girl says, you know what, forget all of them. Let's go over here. I really want to hear what you have to say. So they go into this area where it seems to be a fun house or this vessel that is a fun house of mirrors. And she's talking with him and she says, well, what are you doing here? And he lets her know that he's from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he, she says that I've learned that, you know, Jersey is the place where all the sinners are. And she gives a little giggle and she's letting him know, well, since we're reaching the end of time and this world is coming to an end, you can't go out of this world unexperienced. And she asks him, you know, are you a virgin? And he tells her yes. And he's very timid and he's holding back. But she's proceeding to slowly take off his clothes and seduce him in such a way. So slowly she's taking off of his shirt. She's unbuttoning his pants. And he's saying, well, you know, I, I can't do this. This is wrong. And she's saying, you know, if we're going to die, you know, might as well die with the happy ending. She gets on her knees as if she's about to perform fellatio on him and she has all his clothes off and she gives the perception like she's about to go ahead and do her do. But as she begins to do anything and get closer to him, she says, F you, you Bible freak, and proceeds to pick up all of his clothes and takes off. Now he's just standing there nude, frozen in shock. Like, I, what am I supposed to do? I'm completely nude, I'm naked. We're out here supposed to, supposed to be spreading the word and, and good news, and here I am naked. What an embarrassment. So he's just frozen in confusion and not knowing what to do. He turns and he sees himself in a mirror and he's looking at his reflection. He says, you're so stupid. You know, you're weak, the flesh is weak, and it's because of you that we're in this mess. He hears a noise and a boom in the distance, but he's not really sure what it is. And as he proceeds to make his way out of this vessel-esque area, which seems to be full of mirrors, he feels this loud boom and it rocks him so much to where he's distorted and his hearing and his vision is a little off to where it knocks him out. When he comes to, he's still lightheaded and groggy, from the boom and we can make an assumption that this is the attack that they were speaking of that it was one minute 
till midnight and there has been this nuclear warfare. But as he gets out, he sees the same girl that has taken his clothing and her eyes are, are bloodshot and there's blood coming out. She's deceased and he sees a sea full of people that are deceased and that have taken the absorption from whatever has, ha has, has happened. But he does see sprinkled here and there a few people that are alive. So not everyone is deceased, but pretty much 90% of everybody that was in that area is gone. And he's looking around and clearly something very traumatic has happened. And he is screaming out, what happened? What happened? And he is just so confused. And the camera pans out to where we can see this sea of people who have been affected by this blast or whatever it is. And when we finally get to the bird's eye view of the camera panning all the way out, we see that it is this giant squid that has landed on buildings in the city. The next scene, we see Wade. He is behind this glass viewing people who are looking at a focus group video and he's watching their reaction. It's a room full of men and they're watching this video promoting New York and coming back to New York, an advertisement of some sort. So he is watching the reaction of this focus group and the video promoting people to come back from New York. So it is present day where we're seeing Looking Glass, which is Wade, watch their reaction. And this video is playing and says, I love New York and I come back for the shows. I came back to New York because of the shows. And then another couple, my wife and I came back to New York because it's romantic. Then we have a police officer who says, if this city gets any safer, I won't have a job. <laughs> He's seeing all of these weird advertisements. And they have one person at the end that says, and most of all, I love the calamari. And after the video, the men, they're writing down their, their reviews on the survey and they're turning them in. So the people that are doing the survey, they're talking to Wade, they're talking to Looking Glass and they're saying, oh, this survey is people says, oh, 10 out of 10. How likely am I to go back? Highly likely. How would I recommend this to somebody? Oh, I would love to go back. Oh, this is great. And Wade says, no, that's not true. You paid me to watch their reaction and I'm telling you, they're putting that down on their, that survey, but that's not how they really feel. And the men say, well, I don't understand why you're saying that because this is what they wrote on this survey. And Glass says they're putting that on that survey because of fear. And one gentleman says, well, I don't understand. It's been 30 years, years. Why wouldn't people want to go back? And they're putting on the survey that they want to go back. And he's letting them know what you're reviewing in that survey isn't the truth. They're afraid, they're scared, they're not gonna make it known that they're afraid to go to New York and people are traumatized from this. You paid me to give you the truth, you paid me to look at their reaction and I know when somebody's lying, they are giving those reviews out of fear. People that live here, people that are in Tulsa, they're, they're, they're horrified and they're not going back to New York anytime soon. Agent Blank, she addresses the precinct and she tells everybody in their entirety, look, you guys have collected suspects. You've done your racist vessel where you try to detect their racism. You have beat people up. That didn't work. And you're pretty much in the same place that you were a while ago and you haven't gotten any new information. So let's sit that aside. You tried that your way. Now I'm going to try mine. Okay, so follow my directions and from this point on, we are gonna do things my way and we are gonna get real information. So the precinct decides to go ahead and go back to their desk and continue with their work. And when Wade sits down, Angela, she says, any news about those pills I asked you for? I still haven't gotten any information on that. And Glass tells her, this is a favor. Therefore, me getting this information back so quickly, it's not gonna come back to me so fast. So we have to work on their clock. They're providing the information, so I don't have anything yet. Stop asking me that. And Angela says, well, you know, it's not something that you're putting on your very prompt and very important list, because I still haven't gotten any information. Glass gives her that look like, you know, what do you want me to do? Agent Blake, she calls 
wade into her office to speak to him a while because she wants to assess what everybody is thinking. When he comes into the office, he still has the mask down. And she says, you know, why do you still have your mask on? I mean, I know who you are. I know what you look like. Why do you still have that on? And he says that while we're here, we always have to put our mask on. We don't know if there's any moles in here. We need to always protect ourselves at all times. She's like, I'm, I get that, but I know who you are. So just pull the mask up so I can look into those sad green eyes of yours. So he lifts up the mask and she asks him, you know, when's the last time you've been back to the East Coast? Because from this file that I'm reading, you were there when the big blast happened. And not only that, you went directly into the force right after the white night. So what's up with that? Are you still terrified? Because from what I read, people that were involved with that, they still wake up with the night terrors. They're still traumatized. And he tells her that I'm fine. I have my job as a focus group observer. I'm fine. That happened years ago. And some people are still trapped in that way of thinking. And that might have happened with them, but that's not my case. And she goes, well, what's up with these pills that um, Sister Knight asked you about? And he looks like, what the hell is she talking about? She's like, look, I'm FBI. I have everybody's desk bugged. And I have a little bugged by the little cactus on your desk. So what are these pills that she asked you about? And he protects Angela in this situation. And he says, this is between her and I. This has to do with her health concerns that I know about. And it's not up to me to give you that information. So he doesn't tell her anything. He doesn't even give her an idea about the pills, when, what, where, how. He covers it up and just says, this is Angela's health concern and I'm not sharing sensitive information about that with you. Wade goes home and he starts the routine of what he does at the end of every day after leaving the office. He gets home, he collects his mail, he goes through each envelope and he sees that one of the envelopes has Cynthia on it and he rolls his eyes in disgust and we see that it's a woman on a picture on the wall so we can make a guess from the beginning that this is an ex-girlfriend, this is an ex-wife, but we can see that there's a connection there that he's kind of a little dusty about and he could care less about. He opens up his can of dinner, he starts to eat that, and we notice that he's watching a very vulgar movie on television. And it's the same movie that has been broadcast and advertised throughout the first four episodes of this season. And it's a very graphic, graphic sodomy scene between two vigilantes, mass vigilantes. And I'm sure that we will get more into depth about who these specific vigilantes are. If you read the comic books, you already know, you have an idea, but as a movie to you, they have not revealed who these two characters are. But it gives you an idea of how graphic the programs are that they're allowing the people to see. They give them a warning at the beginning that it's vulgar, but they still play it. While he's watching this movie, he hears this alarm and he goes outside and he thinks that his, it's his car alarm, but it's not his car alarm. He then proceeds to go to what looks like a safe house unit or facility. He goes in there, he turns off the alarm or tries to cut off the alarm and the alarm is not cutting off. But when he finally gets it to cut it off, by removing it from the wall and throwing it down, he makes a little note on a check sheet about how long it took him to get to the safe house and how long it took him to cut off the alarm. In disgust and being upset, he calls this customer service number to let them know, hey, I've done this testing several times and I'm calling to let you know that this device is not working and somebody needs to come fix it. The voice that's on the phone says, well, we'll mail that out to you and it'll take a couple of days. And Glass says, well, no, 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 no. This needs to be sent to me overnight as soon as possible. And they said, hey, well, we can send it overnight, but that's gonna cost you more than the device itself. And he's like, I don't care, send that to me. So with this, Scene, we can see that he told Agent Blake that he's not traumatized from the, the, the big event that happened um, in 1985, but it's evident that he's still running drills about going into a safe area if there's another atomic blast or if there's this next squid that's gonna come from the sky. So he is still very traumatized 
from that and he proceeds to go to sleep within that safe haven vessel because he's still traumatized from it and we see that in this scene it's another day and wade is watching another focus group at work and he gets a page that says cynthia come get your pills so it's some from that individual named cynthia saying come get these pills so we know that the results of whatever the pills are um, has come to a conclusion or she has this answer. So he goes to this company and asks for Cynthia Bennett, but he first gives a marital name and says, oh, I forgot Cynthia Bennett. So we then know that these two were married at some point. And the company that he goes to, it's a company that clones animals. If you've lost a pet, if you've lost your doggy, if you lost your cat, this company clones those animals to give it to the people. He walks into the office and he sees Cynthia and she has a little puppy and she says, does this puppy look like this one? Be honest. And he says, well, that puppy is just a little bigger. She says, oh, okay. And she proceeds to put the dog in this little cabinet where I guess it's destroyed so she can start over. And he says, look, you got some mail, so here you go. And she's like, oh, you know, the post office never gets this stuff right. And she says, well, you know, your pills, it's nostalgia. And I hope your friend that has these pills, and I can guess that it's a lady friend, that they need to get rid of these pills because it's outlawed to take these. And he says, well, what makes you think that it's a lady? And she says, well, because you tend to make bad decisions when it comes to women. And if it's somebody asking you to do these tests on these pills and I do the research on these pills and they're outlawed, it's gotta be a woman that's putting you in the wrong direction because you have a terrible decision-making when it comes to women. He says, well, I was with you for seven years. And she says, well, yeah, and though, uh, for all of those seven years, I took that time trying to convince you that I wouldn't take your clothes and run off with them in a time of, an, of a blast. So we know that during their marriage, he still suffered from that trauma. And every day he thought that this giant squid or some type of explosion would happen. So he suffered from that trauma. He lets her know that he thanks her for doing the research on the pills, but he's not there for a lecture, so he takes off. Wade goes to an extra dimensional anxiety meeting where it's people gathering to talk about their trauma from what happened in 1985. Everybody's sitting down and talking about their experience. And one gentleman says, you know, even though I wasn't in the blast, my mother was. And even when my mother got pregnant 10, 11 years later, I'm suffering from the trauma. Some way, somehow, that traumatic experience, that ex anxiety has passed down to me. Now, at one point, you know, I was gonna call EDS, but I didn't want them to cover my head in tinfoil and make me crazy. So when he says that, we see a flashback scene from when Wade has this tinfoil or certain type of cloth, cloth in his baseball hat. And it's also the same cloth that he uses as he as is looking glass. So we can tell that he's reached out to EDS because he's had some trauma. But when the guy says it, Wade gives this nod down like, Wow, I'm really going through it. But Wade tends to play that off and he says that we must not live in fear. We must live past the trauma because I was there, but in my life, I've moved past it. It no longer takes control of me. So we've got to stay focused. We've got to move forward. And as he's saying this, we see another woman who's looking at him in interest, really trying to focus and listen in on what he has to say. After the meeting, Wade, he notices the lady that was looking at him in the meeting and she's in the parking lot and she says, you know, you're still afraid, you're still scared. And he says, excuse me, what are you talking about? She says, you're still, you're still scared, you're still dealing with it. And he tells her, well, if that's what you want to believe, but while you're dealing with what you're dealing with, we have meetings on Tuesdays as well, so I guess I'll see you on Tuesday. And she says, what do you do when you leave here? 
And he's very hesitant to answer her, but she says, you know, why don't we just have dinner and why don't we just talk? Because you can tell that she's trying to connect with him and just chill for a little bit. They go to a local bar, they got some beers, they're sitting down talking to one another. And she says, you know, you're still in that tunnel of confusion and loss. You don't have to lie to me. I can tell. I know this. And he says, you know, well, what do you do for a living? And she says, well, I'm a waitress. He goes, no, you're not, a, you're not a waitress. I know when somebody's lying. She says, well, I, I work with foreclosures. It's like, no, that's, that's not what you do either. And she says, all right. I'm a radiologist. Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm a cart. Uh, yeah, a radiologist. That's correct. He says, okay, well, that's the truth. Yeah. And she looks at him and says, Lady Pale Horse, does that ring a bell? And he's looking at her like, what? Well, what does that mean? She's like, you know, Lady Pale Horse, directed by Steven Spielberg, came out in 1992, won a dozen awards. You don't remember that? And he's just like, well... No, I, I don't know what you're talking about. She says, that's interesting because I've seen that movie over and over again. And even though I've seen it, I'm compelled to watch it every single time. And one of the things that got me was in the movie, you know, it's black and white. But we, there's this little girl, she had a red coat on. And you know it's red because it's this dominant, bold color, even within the black and white film. And... After the squid lands, you know, she's under the squid in this area. She's crying out for her parents and in agony of what she just saw. And that just, that just really stuck with me. And that was just really, like a really deep scene. She's very repetitive in wondering, why aren't people scared? People are walking around like everything's okay, but it rains little tiny squids around here and people aren't scared. Why aren't people scared? And Wade says, you know, we both need to call a taxi because, you know, you're a little drunk and I'm a little tipsy myself, so we need to get out of here. And as they leave the bar, she calls herself a ride and she says, I'll just call myself a ride, you know, even though I'm drunk. And are you going to be OK? He says, yeah, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm really, you know, I'm tipsy, but I'm not that messed up. So they wait on the rides and they just talk a little bit and they start to connect. And you could tell that there's this wall that Wade slowly lets down because he hasn't had this connection with anybody in a while. And she tells him that they'll meet again. You know, she offers him a cigarette. You know, they're just kind of winding down. And we see Looking Glass finally just take a breath and breathe a little bit. And as she does that, her ride pulls up in, the tr in a truck. She gets in the truck. And he notices that as she takes off in the truck, some lettuce falls from the back of the truck. And he runs to the lettuce and he's immediately thinking about the truck that was being reviewed um, from the supremacy group. And he calls in on his radio and he says, hey, did we receive any information about the truck that was from the event of the last shooting that they had? And they said, you know, that's a negative. So we start to feel the intensity of the episode because he knows that he has to follow this truck to figure out what the heck is going on. He follows the truck, he asks for backup, and when the truck stops, it is at this abandoned factory and he's watching the truck, he's looking at them get out. He watches them enter the factory, he goes closer to the truck and we start to hear the ticking sound of the series. So every time we start to hear this ticking noise, we know that it's about to be something pretty intense that's about to happen. He goes up to the truck. He looks inside of the truck. He sees that there's a revolver inside of the vehicle. He takes that out. He slowly makes his way into the factory, following around, seeing if he can find any clues. And we have an eerie scene that he sees the same church backdrop that they've been looking for because they've been searching all of these churches to match the, the, the video of the people that are in the, the, the Roy Jack masks because they've been looking for a church, but it's not a church that, at all. He now sees it in the factory. They have this set up scene 
for all of their videos. And he is, you could just see the adrenaline and he's just confused at his, what is going on. He hears a voice, so he starts to hide somewhere in the room next to one of these prop pews. And there's a basketball that drops in an area near him. He hears somebody says, oh, it landed over here. So he picks up the ball and starts to go to another room. And the gentleman has a Roy Rojak mask on. And Wade proceeds to follow him into the next room. And as he gets closer and closer, he sees that it's a room full of individuals with a Rojak, Rojak mask on. And they're throwing basketballs in what looks to be something that teleports items from place to place. And they're writing down with each ball that is being thrown in, where the ball ends up. So they're throwing it, writing down where the basketball goes. And he musters up courage and he tells everybody to just freeze, stop where you are, that he's police. And the young lady that he met at the anxiety meeting, she says, wait? And he says, you know, just everybody freeze. And she says, you know, put the gun down. And she's letting him know it took us a while for us to get you here. He proceeds to th fire off some shots, but she's like, those are blanks. It took a lot of time for us to plan to get you here. You know, practicing and letting the lettuce fall out the back, you know, putting the gun in the vehicle. And that radio that you're calling into, that's not going to the precinct. That's actually going to a channel of us. You've been talking to us. So put the gun down. A gentleman. In one of the Rorschach masks, he says, Wade, we don't have to play this game. Let's just sit and let's just talk. And Looking Glass says, you know what, Senator? You don't have to try to disguise your voice because I know that that's you. And he takes off the mask and we see that it is the Senator. And he says, you know what? I know this is strange, but you know, I wear this mask because I'm a politician and I need to make sure that the white knight doesn't happen again. And Looking Glass is just in confusion, like, what are you talking about? You know, it's evident what side that you're on. It's like, that's just a lot that you need to learn. And we want to show you the truth. I want you to see the truth. The senator proceeds to tell Looking Glass, look, I want to share the truth with you. I want you to know what's going on and I want to share this with you so you're not afraid anymore. So you won't walk around as if another squid is going to fall from the sky. So first of all, Agent Blake, she suspects that Angela, you know, Sister Knight is already the suspect or she knows who killed Judd. So let's just push that along let's just push that narrative along and i need you to help me to push that narrative along and give them information that you need on her because that's the information that we need we need to find out who killed judd at this point so go ahead and push that narrative and work with me on this and i'm going to show you something that was shown to me when I was elected. And when I was elected, you know, I thought I was gonna have this sexy job. Maybe I could go into investigative, maybe I could go into something else, but no. They showed me this tape that allowed me to see the truth. So Wade, he sits down and he proceeds to play the video. And the first person we see on the video is Adrian Veidt. And he begins to speak and he says, well, hello. Assuming this is January 21st, 1993, you were just inaugurated and congratulations, President Redford. I am recording this in 1985, seven years prior. And that weapon, there's this weapon that was created um, to create fear and it's a hoax. It's engineered to be a hoax and I have to do that to retain the peace. And I, I'm showing this, to you because I need to get your trust. So the immediate confusion of Wade as this can't be real. So this was created to control the people and create fear. But even though it's a hoax, even though it didn't happen, it still created trauma and it's still something that he lived through. So a lot of things are going on in his head at this point. It was a facade and a hoax to get the fear of the people that he went through something traumatic years ago and it was a secret. What's going on with the senator is a lie, that he's playing both sides of the fence 
to keep people in fear, but at the same time keeping peace, giving the facade as if the police are keeping everything under control. So it's all this information at one time that has weighed absolutely floored. Adrian, we go to his area. He is ready to be counterpolted with this machine. They've done enough test runs. He is confident enough that he can do this now. The clones, they get him on this catapult. He's in his special suit. They thrust him into the air and he goes far and far and so far that he goes through this field that has kept him inside of that area, not being able to escape. And when he gets through that, he is what we can attest to or guess as a moon that is near planet Mars. Because when he lands on his feet, he sees Mars in the distance. And he's looking around like, I made it. It worked, I made it. Well, we see a lot of the clones that died that didn't quite make it. They landed, but they died. Their suits didn't hold up. So what he starts to do, he starts to break off their legs and arms, and he's beginning to make this formation on this moon or on this little planet or whatever that it is. And he makes this, this, these words that say, save me and he's looking at a satellite that is going around he's trying to get the satellite to capture this image and as he's sitting there and he's just so engulfed at this accomplishment that he's made to get out of that force field and get out and to put a message that people can see he is pulled back back to earth and as he be, he's being pulled back to earth, the clones are looking at him and he's confused about why he's being pulled out of this test run and doing what he needs to do. And we see the masked, masked man that shot at him in another episode and he says, you know what? We agreed that you would stick to the rules and you have not, you know, you have not kept your word. I must, you know, go ahead and deal with the consequences. You are not keeping up your end of the deal. He chops off the helmet that's going to the suit to let him know we're going to stop this right here and right now. So we know that this man is stopping this effort and Adrian doing whatever he's doing to escape. Then the masked man even places Adrian under arrest. So we can guess that something is happening to where he's about to be punished for trying to escape this area. Wade goes back to work that next day and as he's sitting at his desk, he's looking at Angela and he's looking around and the office as if everything he's ever been told is a complete lie and he is completely confused and doesn't know which way to go. Angela stop by, stops by his desk and it's like, okay, so what's going on with the pills? And he tells her, you know, that they're, they're, they're the nostalgia pills. And is anything true? Is anything true? And Angela's confused and like, what do you mean is anything true? He says, is anything true? The pills are nostalgia, but you know, is anything true? And Angela says, so this is the nostalgia? This is someone's memories? And Wade says, you know, whose memories? You know, I, whose ever pills that they, they are, clearly they're, they're memories. And, I want to help whose memories and he's looking at the cactus to where he remembered when agent Blake said that his desk was bugged so he you can tell that he's purposely wanting a reaction from Angela and Angela says okay look they're my grandfather's he said he killed you but I don't believe that because he's super old you know he's in a wheelchair so I, I don't know why he's saying that and looking glass looks at Angela and says I'm sorry. She goes, for what? What are you talking about? Then we see Agent Blake. She has her gun out. We see officers start to arrest her. And she's looking at looking glass like, why? Like, why would you do this? What is going on? And they put her under arrest. So we know that he's made his decision to push that agenda forward and to help the senator. Later on that evening, Wade, he goes home. He's checking his mail. He's about to start his routine that he does every day. We're eating his dinner out of the can and watching the same movie over and over again in his mask. But before he can get into the house, he noticed that he has the package 
from EDS of the alarm system that's used for people who want to do testing to time how long it's going to take for them to hear an alarm or some, a boom or something for them to go into shelter. And he looks at it and he's starting to evaluate everything that he's learned, that the square was engineered to frighten him, that it wasn't real. And he throws it in the dumpster, in the trash can. You think he's walking off and that he's not affected by it anymore. But then he walks back and he gets the package out of the trash and he goes into the house. When he does that, we see a truck pull up full of men with Rorschach masks on with rifles and they go into the house to get Wade. And that is the end of the episode. This episode, I think, is the shift that we've been waiting on. People that have watched the show, they're saying, okay, this is still boring. I don't get it. It's just looping. There is a lot of information to go over. There are so many people to learn. So to just dump everything and just give us everything at one time wouldn't make any sense. We only have nine episodes. So we know that they're saving that crescendo for the end. We have gotten to that shift to where people are starting to make decisions or they're confused and they're not sharing information because it's at this point, who can you trust? Who can you trust? Who can you tell information to? Angela's trying to figure out information of who she can trust with the information that she's found. She's trying to figure out what's going on with Will. Will and Lady True have that relationship and, and, and working out something that's clearly time, time sensitive and something that's about to happen on their end. So it's, it's, it's this dynamic of people learning so much information and everybody is trying to figure out what to do with information that they have. I do think that Agent Blake knows more than she's letting people know because she's trying to figure out everybody. She's trying to see, is this cop precinct more corrupt than I think it is? Who can I trust out of this group? We they kind of give an indication that Agent Blake and Angela will join forces eventually because they start to realize that they can trust each other. But now we have a potential mole, which is um, Wade and the information that he knows. Will he eventually tell Angela about the footage that he saw? It's evident that the gentleman in the Roy Jack mask, they're getting weighed because they don't want to take a chance in that. They don't want to take a chance in him giving Angela some information and him letting the cat out at the, out the bag about the senator. So I can feel and I can see this crescendo building. Stay patient. Let the story build. Um, it's only season one. Breathe. <laughs> it's okay. Remember your patience with the Game of Thrones. Remember that. Remember your patience with the Sopranos. Just to remind you, okay? Remember your patience with The Wire. All right? All of those shows had that steady uphill climb in the learning who's who and what's what and what the heck is going on. But when we learned everybody, when everybody, all of the characters learned each other, when all the characters knew the situation, then you had the shift. Then you had stuff that started to happen. And in the show, I do feel that this is the episode where we have that tilt of truth that is starting to come out. People are learning. You know, Angela's learning about Judd. Man, this is not, this is not the guy who I thought it was. You know, um, will Looking Glass say, man, these Rojak people really aren't that bad? Or is he still conflicted? Very good episode. It was slow, but like I said, Wade was able to see some truth. He was able to see uh, something that once again has changed his life traumatically and learning what he went through with the, the squid and saying, wow, you know, uh, I'm not losing it. It was a squid. It wasn't a bomb. But at the same time, I still lived through that. I saw people die. Um, so, so I'm still loving the series. Um, are you still hanging in there? Are you still, um, angry? Do you want it to speed up a little bit? Is it going too slow? Let me know, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell. So you don't miss any posts and follow me on Instagram at the same profile name, official bun underscore E. I would also like to say that I pardon this review and this recap 
being a week behind. Last week, I lost my voice completely. It was very scary. I couldn't do any of my podcasts. I couldn't do any of my videos. I went to New York. I had vocal strain. And I was literally like this. I had no sound. So I had to drink tea and, and honey and just try not to use my voice, hoping and wishing that it wouldn't <laughs> go on another week. I'm still a little hoarse. I made sure to get a lapel microphone so you could hear me better because people say, were, were saying and commenting that the volume needed to be better. I have invested in lapel, a lapel microphone so the sound could be better. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. This is only what? The fifth month of me doing YouTube. So I'm still learning and I appreciate your patience as I grow and as I develop and I give you guys what you need to hear me, to see me, etc. Okay. So have a wonderful night. This next, next episode tonight is coming. So now we are caught up, right? Episode five. This is episode five. We are caught up. I will put episode six up Monday. All right. Cause it takes a while to edit and then post. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, week, evening, everything. All right. I love you guys. See you later. Bye.